Just a reminder that uh, I'm using a, a source called Christianity for Dummies. So if you, uh, not to offend anyone with that title, it's the title of you know, the whole dummy series that is out there. And uh, this is what is written by Richard Wagner. If you wanted to get it, uh, this week you want to look at chapter 4 in that book. Uh, specifically pages 69 and 70, if you just want a short read. And uh, I encourage you to, to take a look at the book, because it, it might answer a lot of questions that you always have. You know, and I, and I would be the first to tell you, I don't have a working knowledge of all of the Christian traditions that are out there. You know, it's, it's like a lot of people would say, you know, I don't really always know that the tradition of baptism in maybe the Lutheran experience versus the Catholic experience versus and so so maybe if, if you're if you're wanting to know some of that or you have friends that might be helpful for you to know some of that that book will give you a lot of insight a lot of good things. So this morning is Romans 323 and then we're going to get to Luke 15 later. But Romans 323 is simply this for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. One of the things that, that Christian churches and what we would call evangelical churches uh, across America have many times misinterpreted what is sin or what sin is within the context of their church and their belief system. Sin is anything that falls short of the holiness of God. That's what it is. But we have so many different orientations in regard to what we do with the subject of sin. Some churches and church traditions have labeled it in terms of sin being weighty, which is, which is in some circles, they, they would call um, that experience um, heavy, and some people look at certain sins as kind of more lighter sin. Or, have you ever heard the phrase white lie? Okay, white lie. What is a, a white lie? Well, it's a harmless lie. I looked it up. This is what the dictionary said. Harmless lie usually told to avoid hurting another person. So then the lie is justified then in our understanding by the outcome. So I can I can illustrate this, you know. Janet and I are shopping and she needs a new winter coat. And so she puts her coat on and you know, as she comes out and says, what do you think? And you gentlemen in here, you know you can already, after a few years of marriage, tell what your wife, your spouse likes or dislikes, right? And I can say, oh, okay, she really likes this coat. So I better like it too. Okay, because you want her to be pleased. And so you, so you, you, you uh, even if it's the most ugliest thing you ever saw in your life, you, you are going to say, that looks pretty good. It's a white lie. The problem with the white lie is even in a white lie, it always has a way of coming out at some point. Because somewhere down the road, as she puts that coat on, she says, you really never did like it. Now, what do you have to do with that? You have to up the lock, don't you? <laughs> oh, I don't know why you're saying that. <laughs> well, now you're in and, and you're getting caught in this whole cycle of lies, what white lies do. It, it just kind of catches you and, and, and sucks you in. So pretty soon, you know, then she says, no, 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 you really did. Then you have to say, yes, you're right. I, I never did really like that coat. Now then, what happens when you say that? Then she comes back with what? How many other things have you said <laughs> that you liked and you didn't really like? That's what a white lie does. That's what, you know, in our tradition, we, we don't have a mortal sin and a light sin. Our passage we read said, all have sinned, period, and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is not a list. Sin, sin is not categories. 
Sin is sin. And even when we say that, I would dare say that in most in, you know, Bible-believing churches, we, we understand that certain sin has greater consequences than other sin, and that's true. But we haven't really fully understood sin as sin. And, and there is always a temptation for us to kind of rank ourselves in this area of sin. Now, the illustration I used a while back, and I'm going to do it again, is, is just this one. Two bottles of pure water. One has one drop of septic system water in it. Who wants to drink? Christian, you're supposed to play them all, okay? All right. Guy, who wants to drink? Well, well none of us want because it's contaminated. Well, don't look contaminated. But it's contaminated. One drop of contaminants makes it contaminated. 99.99% pure is not pure. It's either pure or it's impure. And, and if, if, we, if we drink that, we, we could just ingest them to form a microbes that might, you know, create and make us sick. It doesn't really matter in this room sin, other than we all have sin. We all are contaminated and have fallen short uh, of the glory of God. And I often say in churches that sin is a prerequisite to becoming a member. Because if somebody does come in and say, I don't really believe in this sin thing, I don't think that I have really fallen short of anything, we really can't serve that person. It's our business here, what we do, is, is, is we help people understand the redemption through Jesus Christ on the cross. That he, as we said at communion time, he bore on him all of our sins and the sins of the entire world he took upon himself. And he died once for those sins, and now he lives again. He, he, he was risen again for our life. And by our faith we place in Christ and we say yes, I believe he's taken care of our sins. We have this eternal life. That someday when this body and this life comes to an end, uh, Jesus Christ has promised us and he said to his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place, I will come again and receive you to me that where I am that you may be also. If we've given our life to Jesus Christ and through faith received him in our lives and his grace and mercy and love. So many times, though, we come to this Bible thing and we think, well, the Bible is just a list of rules, do's and don'ts. What we can do, what we can't do. And I, I remember so vividly years ago, back when I was working in a youth program out in Wyoming, and one of the girls came and she said, I want to talk to you. So I, I said, let's go. We'll go talk in my office if you want to be right. She says, okay, I just need to know. Everyone keeps telling me, don't go too far. Don't go too far. What is too far? And I knew she was involved in a relationship. And I said to her, I said, Jenny, if you're asking that question, then probably something is not right. It's disturbing you. That's the reason you ask the question. What she wanted me to tell her is exactly, tell me the rule book. Give me the Bible in form of rules. What can I, can't I do? What can we, can't we do? And you know what? The Bible doesn't really do that. The Ten Commandments are not given there as a rule list. It's given there so that we understand the holiness of God. It's to reveal to us God's holiness and his purity. But he is 100% completely pure. And how we fall short. But it's, it's not just a, a rule book orientation. And a lot of churches get into this room. What can I do? What can I do? What did you do? What did you not do? And, and I want you to understand within this context that there are churches that have said to people, because you did this and this and this, way back there, you're disqualified. I cannot see that in light 
of God's grace, mercy, and love. If you can't have a fresh start, then where can you find true forgiveness? I see Jesus always, as I see him reflected in the Bible, as, as, as a person that breaks those rules that religion has put on people. And, and they say, what are you going to do with her, Jesus? She's been caught in the act of adultery. And Jesus said, you without sin cast the first sin. I see just an incredible, powerful grace, love, and mercy expressed in Christ. And I've had people come and join churches that, that I've been at in the past, and they said, well, that church over there, they won't let me teach Sunday school. That church over there won't let me join in the board. That church over there won't take us as members because we did. You know, where in the Bible did Jesus say, you are just totally excluded? His inner circle was quite a riffraff of people involved in a lot of stuff. And Jesus always said, even to the thief on the cross, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I think often Jesus was telling the Pharisees of his day, and that's the second trap of sin, it's called legalism. Legalism. Here's what we demand you be before you become part of us. And, and, and Jesus was always confronting that with the Pharisees. Remember, Jesus healed someone on the Sabbath day, and the Pharisees said, Foul! You can't do that. That's work. And Jesus says, I can't relieve this man of his suffering on the Sabbath day, otherwise it is work. Shouldn't the Sabbath day be used to give glory to God? And through healing, this man has received a new lease on life. But their legalism so blocked them from seeing God's grace and love and mercy. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If you, if you need to highlight that verse and, and, and write that verse down in the front of your Bible, do that. If therefore if anyone is in Christ, anyone who comes to Christ for forgiveness and for life, he is a new creation. Now that is a very powerful statement. That means God did, didn't just tune the engine up. He didn't, just, he didn't just fix the problem. He said, I put a whole new engine in that vehicle. You are a new creation. And if anyone in here needs to, to have that as a therapeutic point, take it as a therapeutic point. It's a beautiful thing. You can come to Christ and be forgiven and become somebody completely new. All that past, he wants you to let go of. And he wants you to have that new person within you. The old is passed away. That's the word for dead. The old is dead. The old has passed away to dead. Behold, the new has come. Christianity 101, therefore, says to us, sin does not define us. And I hope that sin does not define us as a church. What defines us as a church? Okay? If, if, it's, not, if it's not sin, because a lot of churches, you know, you, you, you walk in the doors pretty, and you're going to pretty soon be confronted with, whoa, this is a this is one of those churches that, you know, you gotta have your stuff together. You gotta, you gotta be, you gotta have it right. Jesus said this. Well, first of all, you know, you know Jesus, he was, he was always accused to be a friend of sinners. They saw in him. They saw that what is he doing eating with the sinners? What is he doing? What is calling out and fellowshipping around the people that are not our type? Jesus said it so well in John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they might have life. That's the purpose of Jesus, give you life. And have it abundantly. 
Barna Research, uh, I, I like to read some of the Barna Research stuff. He, he does a lot of Christian polling. And, I, and boy, we, we all know don't we, the problems with doing polls and statistics in this country. And I'm not, I'm not saying that every poll is right or accurate. But Barna did a, a research across the United States and wanted to know how many churches would be defined Bible-believing churches like this one would be defined by grace, would be defined by mercy, would be defined by God's love, and how many would people say if they were interviewed, oh, that, that church is, 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 is you, better have it, you better have your stuff put together there. You better have it right, or otherwise they're going to come after you. Okay? Defined by what I would call sin. And about 70% of the culture, the culture, that doesn't mean everybody goes to church, said they see conservative churches across America more involved with what you are and what you do than God's love, grace, and mercy. Okay? But 50% of those who profess to be Christian stated that church is not the place you want to be if life is starting to get tough. Okay? If you're starting to have marital problems and you're starting to have family problems and you're starting to, have, you know, life is falling apart, 50% of the people they surveyed said, I don't think you want to go to church. In fact, you just kind of want to distance yourself from church when things get tough. Because there's a doubt there that the church can show the mercy and grace and love of God. That they really know how to surround around you and, 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 and uh, help you understand God of love. In the midst of hardship. Now that's very telling when you think about it. And, and what we really need to be is Romans 5:20 churches, is what Barnabas said at the end of this whole sermon. Romans 5:20 just says, where sin abound, grace did so, so much more abound. That's Paul talking about his church. Are there sinners in church? We have to be. All have sinned, Paul and John Glory. Does sin define us? No. We're defined by life in Christ. Doesn't mean that it means that sometimes in our testimony we share about who we are and what we've come through and the things we've experienced. But we always share it in light of the wonder of God's redemption and love. Hey, I, we saw a tape this morning in Sunday school. Who's that guy again? I don't See, know. See, I don't know any group pass, you know. What was his name? Brian something. Brian Welch? Yes. Well, she was the drummer for one of the rock groups. And he, Corn. For the group Corn. Thank you. And he came to know Jesus Christ. And then that guy was on the doorstep of death with drugs and alcohol and everything else. And what a marvelous testimony he gave that we got to watch today in video. That's the church. And he can use that experience of his life and God's redemption in his life by sharing with others, hey, I was there. I was on the doorstep of death. You couldn't get any further away from the things of God than me. That's what he could say. And yet God redeemed me. And by grace I am saved. That's the story. That's the marvelous part of God's redemption that we celebrate. Now, we go to Luke chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, you might want to just turn there. Luke chapter 15. We're going to read through it in the story of Product Seven. And it's a modern story. It simply reads like this. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger son of them, starting at, I'm starting at verse 11... Verse 12, now, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into the far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country. He began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him into a field to feed pigs. Now, 
I don't have to tell you this. In, in the Jewish custom, you don't want to be around pigs, right? Okay? And he was and he was longing to be fed with the good with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So now he's destitute. Now, in our culture, in Western culture, we, we see this guy as the bad boy. Okay. What he actually did to his father, if we understand this in Middle East culture, he came to his father and he basically said, Dad, uh, I know you're going to croak here someday, but you're really in really good health. And I just don't want to wait that. So you've got a pile of money, you're kind of sitting on some gold, <laughs> so I want mine now. So I want to enjoy it. Because if, if you do last till 90, you know, I, I might be like in my 60s, and I won't have that money to really enjoy when it's time to enjoy it. So I want to enjoy it now. I want all that life has to give me now. So what he basically said to his dad was, give it to me now. Which is a total act of disrespect to his father. And to his brother. Because he's saying to his brother, I'm going to run off with the money. You take care of dad. You take care of the family estate. You do all the work. I'm going to run off and I'm going to do it. And we look at him. And certainly, in American sense, he, he is, uh, he is uh, not a child of gratitude in any way, shape, or form. And so, so that, this is what he did. Now, we go on with the story. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. Verse 18. I will rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to call your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, see yourself in this. There's an old hymn called At Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride. I cared not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for my sin he died at Calvary. Then he came around and said, whoa, I've been out running around in the world, squandering my life and all that God has given to me, not really considering it as worthy of anything. And then I don't know when that time is in your life, or maybe it hasn't yet come to you. But there's a time when you say, wow, he really did. He died for me on that cross. He gave his life for me. He took upon himself my sins that I could be pure water again. And that overwhelming feeling of gratitude and love that is a mark of the Christian life 101, Christianity 101, we are filled with humility and gratitude for what Christ did for us. And that son all of a sudden hit him. You know what? My dad's servants live better than I do. I am an heir and I'm living with the pigs. And there's a lot of people in our culture and society today living with the peace. They are helpless and hopeless. And they know that they're hitting rock bottom. They turn to drugs. They turn to alcohol. They turn to anything that's going to give them maybe a, a sense of happiness and joy in their life. And we're going through this in Sunday school. And I said, that book's amazing because it's just following everything and what we're doing. And I don't know, you've got friends, you've got people out there, you know they turn, they turn to money, they turn to stuff. Today was a lesson on stuff. All the stuff of our life that is going to satisfy me and make me happy. You know? And it's just a trap. But all of a sudden you realize that if everything I ever wanted was a reality in my life, I still would not be happy. I would just need more and more and more and more. It's a trap. And the son came to that understanding and he said, I'm tired of living like this. I'm going to go back to my father. I'm going to go back to Christ. And I'm going to say, hey, thank you, you redeemed me. And I don't want anything. I don't need anything in return. 
return. I will be one of your servants and serve you. That's who we are as Christians. But then Christ says to us, no, you're going to be heirs. Heirs. And he preaches the kingdom of God. You're going to be heirs of the kingdom. And you say, no, I, 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 I've been unfaithful to you. I, I've been out living my life the way I want to and trying to bring happiness and joy to myself. And I find out it just didn't work. I deserve to be just one of your servants. And the fact that I can live at all is enough. And Jesus says, you don't understand. It's called mercy and grace. I'm not going to give you what you deserve. But grace means I'm going to give you the blessing of eternal life and so much more. And because of that, our lives are filled with gratitude and thankfulness, which defines us as God's people. How do we reach the world for Christ? Yelling at them that they're sinners? Going to hell? That wasn't Jesus' plan. He said, I am come that you might have life. I'm more concerned that you find life. And have it both. Ah. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly now the best robe and put it on him, verse 22, and put a ring on his hand and shoe on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this is my son. He was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and found. And they began to celebrate. That's Father's perfect. Now, what did the first, the oldest son do? Verse 25. Now, his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house, and he heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked, these things men. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. And his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, I have worked for you, I have toiled for you, I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat and I might, that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Ooh. Now who is that? A lot of people see that as the church. Sing in the choir, pay my tithe, do my work. And God redeems these misfit, scum of the earth people that deserve nothing. They should get what they have coming. That's fair. And God says, no, we won't stop. You're forgetting something. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whosoever believes in him shall not perish. Whoever. But have eternal life. It is all about grace and mercy. And we have to be a people filled with gratitude that welcomes with grace and mercy. Now, if you understand this story, in light of the Middle East, our culture sees it more in, in a little different way than they 
Which son really offended his father the deepest? Would be the oldest one. Because when his father reached out with redemption to this son that was wayward, the other son totally and completely dismissed him and his love and rejected the father for reaching out in love to his own son. So Jesus is saying to us, his church, that out there is the world I so much love. And when you bring yourself in together and kind of celebrate your holiness and your goodness, you're really slapping me in the face because I died for them as much as for you. And when we dismiss ourselves in this whole thing of, of, of reaching the world for Christ, we, we are really slapping Jesus in the face again and again and again because he said, I so love, I gave the whole world. And there's a lot of interesting people out there who got a lot of bizarre ideas. And Jesus says, even so, Embrace them with my love and mercy and grace. And in a world that's so filled with hate today, who is going to be the instruments of God's mercy, grace, and love? Well, we, the church, have a huge responsibility to say to the world, stop! We welcome you. Why? Well, first of all, because he first loved us. And secondly, because we've experienced that love. And see, the oldest son forgot that. Because he started looking at himself in terms of, I rank here, and my brother ranks down here. I'm better. And Jesus would say, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so when we understand God's redemption in our life and the very fact that I'm as ugly inside as anybody out there. Oh, I haven't murdered anyone. <laughs> haven't I? You know what Jesus said to the Pharisee? You say you haven't murdered anyone, but you have in your heart. There is nothing out there that I'm not capable of doing in my own way. And Jesus is saying to us, to his church today, how far are you willing to reach out into the world that I so love? His grace and love and mercy. That's what defines us. And then at the end. And he said to him, verse 31, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this, your brother, he was dead. And now he is alive. He was lost. Now he is found. I have come that they might have life. We have it abundantly. We need to break the cycle. The destructive cycle in our world today. The church of Christ needs to remind us all in the world around us God so loved. Define that. Barnes research. The good news of that was 
Every growing church that when he did his research across America, every growing church that was experiencing that new life and bringing people into the fold, into the body of Christ, were defined by three terms. Grace, mercy, and love. Their membership said it openly. We want to be a church that really shows God's love. We want to be a church that really has God's grace. Love, mercy, grace. Christianity 101. Let's pray. Lord God, help us to wrestle with this inside, to find our own areas that block us from showing your love to others because we all do that. We've all, from time to time, looked at our lives and not really done a fair analysis of what and truly we are. And help us, Lord, as we come to terms with ourselves and the, and, and the realization that you have given us this great redemption, that we will transfer that over into the lives of other people and be redemptive in our lifestyle. Maybe this week there's someone we work with that just needs a little extra patience and a little more love. Maybe somebody just needs to hear that they are loved in a world that's filled with hate. And Lord, help us to be that instrument that reaches out and dares to be different when the world is marching to a beat that is really destructive. And we ask that through Christ our Lord. Amen. Whatever.